and welcome to Retech. And today, on our Sinclair Computer History, we're going to look at the ZX81. So, we've done the MK14, the Sinclair ZX80, and now it's bigger brother, the Sinclair ZX81, and that's in this part, which is part three. Now, the ZX80 and the MK14 were massive successes for Sinclair. But it was the ZX81 that started to change things, especially in the UK, and especially as far as generating new business, generating new programmers, generating new companies is concerned. Now the ZX81 is an iconic machine now. It's so much in the psyche of the UK. It's been used in a lot of programs, it's been referenced in a lot of programs, and also it's a machine that everybody knows. If you're not in the UK, you probably know it as a Timex Sinclair 1000, and also maybe the Timex Sinclair 1500 as well, because that was kind of an expanded ZX81. So the ZX81 has been around in different countries in slightly differing forms, but the basic machine is exactly the same. It was the computer that moved things on. And one of the ways it did that was it allowed access to computer hardware, computers themselves, for not a lot of money. So we're going to take a look at the Sinclair ZX81. Now, Timex brings the power of the computer within reach of more people than ever before. Introducing the Timex Sinclair 1000, the first of a new generation of computers designed to be easier to use and to own. For $99.95, power to learn at the speed of light, power to organize with unfailing accuracy. The Timex Sinclair 1000 power is within your reach. Now, there's a lot of detractors out there against the ZX81, and... Um, I can kind of see where they're coming from to a point, but you have to look at it at kind of a mindset of the early 1980s. You see, the ZX80 was a very good machine for what it cost. It had its limitations, it had its shortcomings, but Sinclair Research decided to answer them with the ZX81. Now, This little wedge-shaped computer managed to make its way into one and a half million homes. That is a huge number of computers, a huge number of sales, and it's at an era where people didn't think that computers were accessible to everyone. Now, you hear people such as Bill Hurd who said it was an awful computer, it was a horrible machine and you know that he kind of just didn't really think it was a computer. Um, you hear others on YouTube saying that it was a terrible computer, it wasn't a very good machine, it didn't do much and so on. Buying a ZX81 was sort of like buying one of those motorized shopping carts you'd see in Walmart and claiming you'd bought a car, where uh, buying a VIC-20 at the time was sort of like buying a Nissan Versa or a Chevy Spark. But that's kind of an opinion of people who are mainly Commodore enthusiasts, um, mainly other platform enthusiasts. And they have a point. They have a point that it is limited. It isn't the best machine in the world, it isn't the fastest machine in the world, it isn't the most powerful machine in the world, uh, it's not the most expensive machine in the world, it hasn't got the best keyboard, it hasn't got the best expansion ability, and that's all true. But what this tiny bit of plastic did was put this power of a computer into the hands 
of a lot of children. You have to remember that at the time. You're talking 79.95 for the cost of this fully built and they were being sold in the likes of WH Smith. Unheard of. You could walk into a newsagent's and walk out with a computer. It's something that never happened. And because of this, people would walk into a newsagent's which also did music and cassettes and so on, and they would see this on the shelves along with the software and peripherals, and normally it was switched on so you could have a go. So you could have a little poke around with it and you could find out what it was all about, and then you could walk out with one, and then you could take it home. And it was driven at the time by the younger people, so children were one of the major driving factors of this machine and the sales of this machine. So let's take for example a 10 year old, that's probably me at the time, wanting one of these. I'd been in WH Smiths, I'd played around with it, I'd learned to do a couple of lines in basic and that was at the countertop in a newsagent's. And if it was any other computer and you said to your parents at the time, I would like a TRS-80 Model 1 or I would like an Apple II at a cost of $1,300, which was a lot of money for somebody to go out and go, let's try this out. Let's put $1,300 down or $500 in the, the form of some of the other machines and then walk out the shop and a week later the child discovers it's not for me, I don't like it. So that machine was then effect effectively put on the shelf, left gathering dust. And there were a lot of computers like that which kind of is why you get so many nice classic machines now because they were forgotten about in a drawer, in a cupboard, in the attic and so on. But this machine, your parent was more than likely to say, we'll give it a go. This little machine enabled a lot of children and a lot of adults to put down 79 pounds and take it away. Didn't matter that it was limited didn't matter that it didn't have the best keyboard in the world, didn't matter that you were going to spend another £50 for a, a memory pack or a RAM pack not long after you bought one of these because you found out that you needed it. But you could piecemeal buy this system where you couldn't do that with a £1,300 Apple or a 500 pound or so TRS-80 and so on. That's what people forget about this machine and to a point Sinclair tried to replicate that in the United States but it didn't go to plan because the memory editions or the RAM packs weren't available at the time the machine was launched so people got a little bit tired of waiting. That was this machine's ultimate demise in the United States really, but he still sold a good number of machines and at one point he was outselling every other machine on the market as far as sales were concerned. The Sinclair range of computers up to now were market successes. You had the MK14 which sold 15 to 50,000 machines. Then you had the ZX80 which sold about 50,000 machines. And now you have the newcomer, the ZX81, which has sold over 1.5 million machines. Now that's a very good track record and that's what basically made Sinclair the number one seller of computers possibly in the entire world at the time.
So you see the ZX80 used off-the-shelf components for the most part and it was only really the ROM that was a work of Sinclair as far as you know the physical hardware was concerned where the ZX81 used a ULA which was a process that in the 1980s um, was a chip which was basically full of gates so these chips with gates in it were programmed to represent or replicate the use of other ICs and for example on the ZX80 there were a lot of components which could have been replaced by the ULA and indeed they were replaced by the ULA leaving mainly the processor the now 8k ROM which has improved basic in the machine and also the memory the memory stayed for the UK machine at 1k this allowed the machine to be sold as a fully assembled kit in the UK for 69.95 or a 49.95 kit and that was unheard of again it was cheaper than the ZX80 it was cheaper than the ZX80 by quite a considerable margin to allow this the ZX81 really um, was again cost reduced even further so we, if we have a look at this Sinclair ZX81 you have a molded black case instead of the ZX80 original blown case and you've also got the similar keyboard the membrane flat keyboard you have an ear and a microphone socket and you also have a RF interface and a power connector and on the back all you really have is a edge connector which is literally the tracks directly out on what we would now call the motherboard or on the board itself with a cutout in the case to allow you to plug in external devices the ZX81, like the ZX80, was limited. It was limited in its memory size and it was limited in its expansion options. Some people even produced sound add-ons for these machines along with various other devices and it was kind of a cottage industry for a lot of new startups. And one of those startups was Quicksilver and Quicksilver produced memory add-ons for these machines at one point but also they produced software if you have a look at um, one of my previous videos about quicksilver software you'll be able to find out a lot more about how this company evolved around sinclair machines now the zx81 also made sinclair a fortune it made basically made him a lot of money and it made his company a lot of money but it also founded a lot of other hardware and software businesses and a lot of these people are still around today who literally cut their teeth on a Sinclair ZX81 one vast improvement over the ZX80 was the fact that the designers mainly Jim Westward of Sinclair Research had kind of adopted an improved approach to the display. They incorporated a slow mode. What about that bloody screen flicker? Hopefully not. And this allowed the ZX81 to not blank the screen every time it was either processing or a key press was being used. Now the ZX81 in its standard form was very limited. It only had one kilobyte. 1K is very small when you come to think about how much memory the screen takes up. A full screen is 793 bytes. The system takes up about 125 bytes. And there are also input buffer stacks which need a little bit of memory on top of all that. But there was a, a program called 1K Chess by David Horn, which um, includes most of the rules of chess. 
in 672 bytes. So this gives you an idea of your Sinclair ZX81 and what you may have had or purchased when you used the machine back in the early 1980s. Obviously software was a big concern and software houses such as Quicksilver sprung up to support the new users of this emerging technology. You also had memory expanders, manuals which you didn't really need anything else other than the Sinclair manuals because they were incredibly good manuals. The basic manual on its own was incredibly detailed, incredibly well put together and it covered things such as the basics all the way through to things you would probably not need until you got to grips with the language itself and to grips with the machine itself. It was that good. Plus also you had dedicated Sinclair add-ons such as their Sinclair 16K RAM pack and there were a lot more peripherals that you could buy for this machine but let's have a look at the basic machine. So you can see the machine set up behind but this is a machine that I've kind of had since I was 10 years old so this is it. It's a well used, well thumbed Sinclair ZX81 and as you can see it's very very 1980s style. You have kind of the graphics of the day. Everything was line drawing, boxed up, box drawings, bright colours, standout graphics and that's basically the only way you can describe this. And if you look closely at the box, you will see it says personal computer. Now Clive Sinclair had always pitched his model as a personal computer. This machine, or the original ZX81s, were registered out of Six Kings Parade in Cambridge. So if you have a look there, you've got Six Kings Parade, Cambridge CB21SN, and that was at the start of the Sinclair research era for Clive Sinclair. So this one started off not in his later offices in Willis Street in Cambridge, which then became his head office. Now, if we turn the box around, you'll see again it's very 1980s in style and it's also just giving you an idea of what you should do with this machine. Basically, everything in red is what you have in the box. The computer, the power supply, the cables and the manuals. Everything else you add in yourself, such as the TV and the cassette recorder. And it actually doesn't hide anything. It says this is what you will need if you want to expand this machine. Well, most people had a TV at home. And if you didn't have a cassette recorder then WH Smith, where you probably bought this from in the first place, would have been happy enough to have supplied one of their rebranded cheap data or computer cassette recorders that they had in abundance. And this is what you would get in the box once you remove the outer packaging. So on removing the cardboard outer you will be left with their polystyrene sleeve and then removing the sleeve which mine seen a little bit better days you ended up with a, a package which included your ZX81, your power supply, your RF and cassette lead and underneath the ZX81 you would find space for the manuals which are which you've seen standing at the back and you've also got your ZX81 software catalogue that they always put in and everything was very dark and dystopian on all of the graphics. It was very 19, early 1980s.
and again six kings parade in Cambridge so again very early on in the Sinclair research era now the manuals that would sit in the box were this one ZX81 basic and that's your basic programming manual for these machines now ring bound and it fits snugly in the bottom of the box and the later manual came as a spine bound manual it's the same manual but the early one in my case was ring bound and this is it so this is your contents of your brand new machine and again this is my original ZX81 which had travelled everywhere I went at the time um, because I was used it for everything I used it for learning how to program and to play the old games such as Scramble from Quicksilver or Defender or various versions of Pac-Man and a lot of homebrew software that you get in magazine listings so was the ZX81 that bad of a machine when you compared it to its contemporaries well you've got to remember that the price point of the ZX81 made it affordable it made it affordable by many and it was massively cheaper in comparison to most well to be honest every machine not most but every machine that was out there at the time and if you got a ZX81 for a under a hundred pounds so you're looking at roughly 70 pounds for a ZX81 then you added in a Sinclair RAM pack or any other 16k RAM pack for about 40 pounds and then if you added in a decent keyboard such as a DK Tronics or a fuller keyboard you're kind of looking at about 150 pounds for a machine then that would be a very usable with nice keyboard a decent amount of memory for the time and a machine that you could put on your desk plug it into a TV and use it use it for most things that you wanted to it's kind of take it or leave it really if you wanted a machine that you could expand if you wanted a machine that you could start off at a low price if you wanted a machine that you could learn with if you wanted a machine that you could use to grow with you then the ZX81 made sense and that was its key and its key was the price is the personal computer not a desirable notion something every citizen would quietly crave if he actually knew what it was price is the key so I hope you enjoyed that look at the Sinclair ZX81 this is part three in our history of Sinclair computers and as I say there's more to come the Sinclair machines have an indelible place in the history of microcomputing and Sinclair machines in general started to move up a notch year by year so they produced a lot of machines in quite a rapid successive order so what we're going to do next is we're going to look at the ultra iconic Sinclair ZX Spectrum so I hope you'll join me on that one and I'd like to go with you on this journey in Sinclair research and if you liked what you've seen please subscribe and I hope to see you on this channel very very soon so thanks for watching